Joining me today on my Women's Voices video blog is Debbie Milnick, documentary filmmaker. Hi, Stephanie. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. <laughs> and I would love to talk to you about your most recent film, Manufacturing Descent. Okay. And I thought it would help if you could give a brief synopsis of the film. Okay. Um, Manufacturing Descent, we're sort of looking at the techniques that Michael Moore uses. It's, it's part biography and part, it, it sort of changed as we were <laughs> doing the film, but it's sort of looking at um, the facts, fictions, and myths around Michael Moore and his documentaries. And as we got into doing this biography about Michael, we, we sort of found out that not everything Michael does is on the up and up, which for me as a documentary filmmaker and as a journalist kind of bothered me because I, I, I think that he can make the same fact, uh, points that he makes in his films um, by just sort of sticking to the truth mm -hmm. and, and everything he does. And I think so we kind of look at Michael and his background and, and his documentary techniques. Okay. And you had mentioned something at the viewing of your film that one of your motivations for choosing Michael as a subject was based in part on your previous films. Yes. And I'd love it if you could say a little more about that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, our last film that we did was called Citizen Black and it was about this uh, conservative press baron called Conrad Black who is now going to jail for um, stealing money from the shareholders <laughs> and we followed him around for like two and a half years and it kind of bothered us being around this right-wing conservative guy for two and a half years and we kind of wanted to rinse our palate a bit and we thought let's do someone who's the total opposite of Conrad Black and to us that was Michael Moore because you know he's liberal he's you know on the left side of things which is what we are too um, and uh, uh, we think he's doing more good for the world than bad, which we, we thought, you know, Conrad Black was definitely doing bad with his uh, right-wing newspapers out there. Um, and even before that, though, I mean, our first documentary was called Junket Whore, and I lived in Los Angeles for eight years, and I was a junket whore. <laughs> I'm a reformed junket whore. <laughs> and I was shocked, I have to say, shocked at how the entertainment industry works. and and how the studios, the publicity machine, just co-ops journalists and gets them to do all these really puff pieces and say good things about really bad films uh, so that the consumer doesn't know what's going on. They'll just pay $10 to go see really bad films. Um, and you know, they fly you out to Hawaii and Mexico or New York if you're from Los Angeles and put you up in nice hotels and you know, pay for everything. And, and then you couldn't ask questions, certain questions of, of the journalists. Uh, sorry, not of the journalists, but of the movie stars. And I thought, well, it just was a horrible feeling being involved in this. And so we did a documentary called Junket Horror talking about all this and exposing it. And then when we moved back to Canada, um, I did something totally opposite, which was a documentary about a, a satirical magazine called Frank, which is kind of like The Onion here. Okay. And just sort of like how freewheeling they are. You know, they've kind of, they get a lot of things right, but also they make some things up and then it ends up hurting people, you know? So it was like, there was this sort of uh, strange balance. But again, I was going from the strange, uh, the strange instances of Junket Horror to Frank magazine. And then from there, we went to Conrad Black, which was this very conservative press baron, and now to Michael Moore, you know? So it, it's almost like this media analysis, which mm -hmm. I, I wasn't really conscious of when we did these films, I, but I guess because of, of the background being journalism, I've always been interested in media and, and how it works. Mm -hmm. How did watching his presence and really investigating his filmmaking techniques help you solidify your identity as a woman filmmaker? How did, how did you come to understand yourself better through making this film? Um, I actually thought that when I looked at Michael's techniques, I thought, again, that wasn't the sort of techniques that I would use, and I, I'm okay with that. You know, I'm, I mean, some of the criticism that I've had from people is, why aren't you more forceful mm -hmm. when you talk to Michael? I mean, when you have him there for, he says 20 minutes, but it was actually only 10 minutes at the end of the film, why didn't you say, you know, these are the papers, I've seen them, these are your, um, the papers which show you own this production company which invested in Halliburton, why didn't you print them off the web? Well, 
I just, I'm not a sort of morally safer 60 minutes type of person, mm -hmm. but I'm okay with that. I, I think it's all right to be a documentary filmmaker and just sort of allow yourself to show mistakes. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's okay. I, you know, yeah, maybe I made a mistake there. Maybe I should have been more forceful uh, because maybe the crowd would, the audience would have been with me more if I had been less kind of like, well, I don't think that's right. I mean, I'm more like, the, I was more bumbling, you know, but I'm okay with showing my mistakes on camera. Um, and after seeing Michael and how he does his films, I think it's okay. I, I do believe more so now that it is okay to show your vulnerability on camera as a woman. And I think that's all right, you know? More than ever, I want to be careful about how I present my films and and sort of sticking to the straight and narrow, making sure I don't take people out of context. It was always important to me anyways before not to do that, but it's even more so now because, you know, you can't, I mean, when you, it's important just to have a, to take care of the people you do interviews with and almost, you know, make sure that you don't uh, lose their trust. And I think when you take people out of context, you lose their trust. Um, and so that part was very important to me to continue to do that. And it was really important in every step of the way when we were editing to make sure that we got everything right. And I would double check sources and say, oh God, we can't say that. I have to change this line because it sounds, it's not right. It, it makes this person sound a certain way. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it was important once I saw Michael's films to sort of make sure I didn't fall down that same pathway. Although, as you see in the film, <laughs> We do fall down that pathway when I make up cards, you know, we make up these cards because all of a sudden the PR people of Michael's camp and this university, Kent State University say, oh, in order to get into the press conference, you need business cards from your company. Well, everyone knows when you do documentaries, you don't have business cards of the television station you're doing it for because you're being commissioned. And we made up the cards, we got into the meeting and then we just said, all right, we have to show them that we made these up. So. Again, you have to keep, I think, the trust between the audience and the filmmaker as well. You know, you have to let them in on what's going on. You shouldn't try to fool the audience ever, I don't think. Because mm. they're the people who are coming paying good money to go see your film. So let them in on what you're doing. That notion of having the filmmaker be a clear player within the actual film that's seen and not sort of an invisible influence. Right. Um, I think that's a very interesting tool to use, and and how do you think that changes an audience's perception of a film, and and in particular people right. who watch your documentary? Well, it is interesting. It it does. And originally, when we started this film, I wasn't going to be a player. It was going to be. I actually thought we'd get the interview with Michael, the um, and that we'd use his voice to do a lot of the narration about you know his his history, uh, and that I wouldn't be in it. I thought it would be like a third person. Um, uh, observational documentary. So when things start happening behind the scenes and I started to say, okay, I think we've got to film everything now, which really takes up a lot of tape. Um, but I, it, we just decided let's do everything because things are happening and we have to show this to the audience. And it does change things because then the audience, you know, you're sort of taking them on this journey and they're discovering things, I suppose, through your eyes. Um, so it is a different view than saying just sort of putting out the documentary and having the different people speak and then saying, this is the film. They're, they're experiencing what you're experiencing and then I guess there's also the empathy you know, for you. Although <laughs> some people hated me, so sometimes there is an empathy. Sometimes they're like, what a wimp. We hate that <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you, know, you can get either response, I guess. Um, it's, it puts you out there. And it puts you out there to be actually attacked more as well because your character then in the film mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, look at this person. You know, it's, I guess, more like Nick Broomfield, I suppose, as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas I think if you're just the director but not actually on camera, you know, people aren't as willing to attack you or love you or hate you either way, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're a bit more anonymous and safer. <laughs> right. Thank you.